The first title is Union. Yoga means union, and karma means labor. Just as consciousness calls us to labor, the work of perfecting our karma, so is union symbolic of the alignment of the chakras and cleansing of the aura that is the goal of karmic work. So we can refer to the work of perfecting our karma as labor, and we can refer to the goal of this labor, the perfection of our karma, as yoga or union. The work of aligning the seven chakras of the spine is one kind of yoga. The work of cleansing the aura externally surrounding each of us is another. This is why the words labor and union also have different meanings. We can refer to our inner work of aligning the chakras via an external symbol, such as the cube stone or perfect ashlar. Likewise, the term union, referring to outer effects of our inner alignments, we can symbolize as a group of workers the chakras, all working together, aligned, toward the same goal, the cleansing of the aura. In order to achieve external yoga, we must first accomplish internal alignment of the seven chakras of the spine. In the same way, RNA unzips the double helix of DNA during cellular replication. The seven chakras are the nerve centers along the spine that deliver the commands from the brain into the gross tissues of the body. The work of aligning these seven chakras is called kundalini yoga. Kundalini represents the interior, upward spiral portion of the toroid energy field of which the aura is the exterior hypersphere. Kundalini is the inner soul or spark of life. After the inner chakras are aligned and the kundalini rises and descends throughout the nervous system unimpeded by retained stress and a desire to distraction, the aura can begin to be cleansed and the external environment itself around the entity will begin to change. This can only occur when the higher external and lesser interior will are aligned both within and around a being. The digital units of change in our surrounding environment are called chi or units of karma and they collectively comprise our aura. We say the aura of a being is cleansed when the being does the good work of perfecting themselves and does this for the right reasons. When such an alignment is achieved, we say the person has completed the great work of karma yoga. They have achieved a condition of labor union. At this point they are, if still alive, automatically members of the order of death. The union among the living and the dead who help others to achieve the great work of labor union. The original founders of this order were the Quarriers Guild of Builders on the Three Great Pyramids. They studied all these types of metaphysics, and it is from them we learn the measure of the Kundalini spiral within the toroid is called Phi, and that the exterior aura's measurement is Likewise, Pi. The second title is Boaz. Boaz is the name given to the southern pillar on the east gateway into the inner temple of the 
first temple called the Temple of Solomon. Any Freemason can tell you that. But what we are studying delves beyond this. What we study is perfect Atlantean masonry. Some Freemasons might try to tell you the pillar of Boaz on Solomon's temple was hollow and that it contained many treasures of the original craft masonry. Do not ask such a mason to recite Boaz's inner inventory to you, however. They will not be able to do it. These, they will tell you instead, are the so-called lost keys of masonry. But you must not bother to ask them what was inside Boaz. Instead, you must enlighten them on the true origins of the southern pillar on the eastern gateway to the temple. Instruct such a mason on the true Shem Ham Farash, not the 72 names of the angels of Exodus based on the 36 Egyptian civic calendar deacons, nor on the Goetia of Solomon based on these 72 angels being used as workers on the first temple. All that, explained to them, is only an allegory for the building of the Egyptian pyramids, followed by the rebellion of the slaves that led to the exodus to begin with. Even the pyramids of Egypt, you may explain to them, were only a repetition of a practice remembered from before the world flood that destroyed Atlantis. Thus we study Solomon to learn the fate of the workers, but we study Egypt to study the craft of the builders. By studying the Apocrypha, books excluded from but belonging in the tradition of the Bible, we can study the historical origins for the builders' practice of safe-housing their tools inside the pillars of their craft. In the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasher, the Three Steli of Shem, on the Eighth and the Ninth, and Plato's Republic, we find recounted an occult history of this secret craft. Before the Flood, before even the birth of Noah, Noah's great-grandfather, Enoch, had a prophetic dream. Enoch commissioned all the knowledge of the universe, inscribed on two pillars, to be buried with him in a tomb nine chambers deep in a secret place. He then instructed his son to give Noah a third stone tablet containing directions to this tomb to survive the flood. Abraham came to inherit Noah's stone tablet, and he took it with him from Ur into Egypt. There, in the catacombs beneath Giza, he secreted it away, the twin pillars of Enoch, and built the pyramids over them, leaving the third key buried beneath the paw of the Sphinx. Moses, also called Akhenaten, then led the enslaved builders of the pyramids out of captivity into Canaan. Solomon then built the first temple to house in its sanctum sanctorium the third keystone. Then Menelech, son of Solomon and the queen of Sheba, stole the stone from within the ark. The remains of the original builders were buried on the shore of the Dead Sea, where they were later discovered by the Essenes, the exiled priests of King David, during the Roman captivity. Their writings, leading to the location of the Ark, were eventually found by the Knights Templar during the Crusades. But the Templars could not enter Egypt and it was not until Napoleon that the pyramids could be excavated. Around this time, Neo-Jacobinism took hold in America, and the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry was created. 
From this source, we learn about the lost keys of masonry, represented by the twin pillars of the eastern entrance to the first temple. But as you can see now, the true order, the Atlantean masons, knew much, much more than anyone since the time of the flood. This order is the modern inheritor to the mysteries of Imhotep and the mastery of Atlantean masonry. All ye who seek knowledge over geometry, let them enter here, and let all you who are able to understand and who can apply, let them calculate the numbers of their own name, for they are among the numbers of the builders of the great pyramids, the first and second temples, and they are brothers in our great order. All of us stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before. In this way we finish our good work, align our chakras to cleanse our auras, and transcend from the cares of the mundane world. The third title is Bariah. The name for the mundane world used among those who have transcended its dull cares, who have graduated from labor and become members in our order, is Asaya. The realm above and beyond the mundane world of Asaya is that with which the order teaches union. This realm, although the lowest of God's highest heavens, is considered paradise and associated with the state of grace possessed in the Garden of Eden before the fall. This realm above the mundane world of Isaiah, the realm of Eden, is called Bariah. How do we achieve transcendental union with Bariah? Some say only through Christ can original sin be forgiven. Others believe anyone righteous in Allah, shall enjoy the fruits of paradise. Both agree such can only be achieved either in the afterlife or in an impossible utopia. Thus, those who believe in Atlantis and those who believe in Eden can both agree that so long as mankind exists in the fallen world of Isaiah, the mundane world of matter and action, of cause and effect, and the lesser will, then Bariah, the world above, remains divided from and beyond us, representing a perfect world infinitely better than the here and now. However, what does this mean to say man is fallen, or that this material reality is inferior to the realms we can presently only imagine? We say that part of man's fall separated Asaya from Bariah by the interjection of a third world called Yetzira. According to legend, Bariah was Eden, but Yetzira, the splendor of the emanations, shattered the vessels of Bariah into the shards of the shells, the cliffotic quanta that comprise Asaya. The material universe. Thus we say that, before the fall, Bariah existed and mankind dwelt in paradise. As the fall happened, the world of Yetzirah passed through the world of Bariah and destroyed mankind's place in it. Thus, after the fall, man dwells in Asaya the earthly or material world. But that transcendence to Bariah is still possible. How is this to be accomplished? How does one align the chakras and cleanse the aura? It is by studying the tree of life and thus restoring the shattered shells and raising up through Yetzira a way to the arisen Bariah. Thus, when we describe Bariah, 
we mean the kingdom to come, the once and future world of perfection. However, to cleanse the aura and achieve Bariah, we must first align the chakras by studying the tree of life. Otherwise, we might achieve, but cannot attain. We can reach, but not grasp, hold, and climb. The fourth title is Formation. Yet Syra is the realm of formation now, after the fall. However, in truth, Yet Syra is the realm of divine creation, and Bariah, the lesser realm, the realm of the formation of Adam in Eden. To align the chakras, we study the tree of life. The seven inferior or lesser sephirot on the tree are equivalent to the seven chakras of our present evolution. The three supernal or crown sephirot refer to the exterior aura of which the seven chakras are the interior spiral. Thus, we use the tree of life as a model for the interior chakras that we can make and form outside of ourselves. The tree of life is the way to transcend from the realm of action to the realm of Yetzira, the divine creation. We transcend by formation, or yoga, the work of making our karma perfect. Formation refers here to studying the tree of life to align our chakras. Formation is the art of crafting one's karma. The more perfectly centered, calmly meditative, and passively flowing one's energy is, the more we say their karma is artfully crafted. The mind, distracted by disbelief, overwhelmed by doubt, and suffering from bad luck, we say such a person as this has bad karma. Karma being the combination of external chi in our aura and the kundalini spiral ascending our spines, then, like all energy fields, moves away from stasis and periodicity by nature, and, most of the time, will decay into chaos and delusions, if not worked upon. Thus, the natural condition of life is, for the majority of us even today, brutish, nasty, and short. However, through yoga union with Bariah, by aligning our chakras, by studying the tree of life, through formation of a more perfect, static, and periodically regular soul, we are graduated from labor in the world of karma in Asaya. Through formation of our souls in Yetzirah, we achieve an increasingly lasting trance of Samadhi, the waking dream. The longer we sustain this trance of calmness and clear mind, the more cleansed our aura will be, and the more we will dwell in Bariah, the lost paradise and perceive all as the divine creation. The fifth title is Water. Among the many documents of our order, we find perfect understanding of the four worlds of Kabbalah according to the following model describing the cosmological creation using the three supernal elements alone to create matter, the earth element of Asaya, the lowest world. These three supernal elements are represented by the three mother letters of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. A is for air, M is for water, and S is for fire. 
God took fire and mixed it with air to form smoke. This we call the realm of Ayin, limitlessness, an aspect of Atsaluth, the highest world. Next, God blew the smoke with his breath and thus mixed it with moisture or spiritual water. The combination of all the smoke and water we call Ein Sof, or limitless nothingness, a lesser aspect of Atsaluth. Next, the stale, ashy water of the moist smoke began to descend, and the sweet water of God's first breath to ascend. As the watery aspects settle below, and the airy aspects above, bolts of lightning fire up, burning away the rest of the clear air. As these bolts of lightning warm the smoke, the water within it evaporates out as condensation. The light of Ein Sof Or, the lowest realm of the highest world, shining through this rain, refracts a seven-colored prismatic arc. Above, the cloud clears, and below, the ashes form mud in the water. From this mud, God made man. So we see now that Yetzira, the emanations, or Sephirod, begin as the fiery bolts of lightning above, become the watery rainbow of air, and finally form the tree of life, connecting the realm of Bariah, water of air, to Uzziah, dry earth from fire. The tree of life, therefore, is equivalent to Yetzira, the realm above Bariah, before the fall, and below it, afterwards. The sixth title is Seven. An initiate of our order, at this degree, should now be able to understand the esoteric meaning for the seven days of creation. These are an allegory for the seven color spectrum of Asaya that comprise the seven lower emanations of Yetzira, which represent, in turn, the seven chakras of our present phase in evolution. Thus, the number seven should be remembered as referring to the way to transcend Asaya by studying Yetzira after the fall in the form of the Tree of Life and thus to align the chakras and cleanse the aura. According to the Hebrew Aleph Bet, the seven chakras, or sephirot, were equivalent to the seven visible planets of ancient stargazing. However, the dutiful student is instructed to remember the relativity between all these base seven number systems is purely a construct created by the founders of our order as a means of remembering the attributes themselves, and their base seven factor system is due only to their convenience in this. In later levels, we will begin to address the grand cross alignment of these seven planets and how this relates to the seven chakras and inferior emanations on the tree of life. However, for now we do not need to remember the significance of these seven planets, only understand how to align the seven chakras by studying the seven lower sephirot on the tree of life. This concludes the knowledge lecture of the titles of 2A Degree Quarriers Guild.